This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 28 to 31. Chapter 28 Ahab. For several days after leaving Nantucket, nothing above hatches was seen of Captain Ahab. The mates regularly relieved each other at the watches, and for aught that could be seen to the contrary, they seemed to be the only commanders of the ship. Only they sometimes issued from the cabin with orders so sudden and peremptory, that after all it was plain they but commanded vicariously. Yes, their supreme lord and dictator was there, though hitherto unseen by any eyes not permitted to penetrate into the now sacred retreat of the cabin. Every time I ascended to the deck from my watches below, I instantly gazed aft, to mark if any strange face were visible, for my first vague disquietude touching the unknown captain, now in the seclusion of the sea, became almost a perturbation. This was strangely heightened at times by the ragged Elijah's diabolical incoherences uninvitedly recurring to me, with a subtle energy I could not have before conceived of. But poorly could I withstand them, much as in other moods I was almost ready to smile at the solemn whimsicalities of that outlandish prophet of the wharves. But whatever it was of apprehensiveness or uneasiness, to call it so, which I felt, whenever I came to look about me in the ship it seemed against all warranty to cherish such emotions. For though the harpooners, with the great body of the crew, were a far more barbaric, heathenish, and motley set than any of the tame merchant ship companies which my previous experiences had made me acquainted with, still I ascribed this, and rightly ascribed it, to the fierce uniqueness of the very nature of that wild Scandinavian vocation in which I had so abandonedly embarked, but it was especially the aspect of the three chief officers of the ship, the mates, which was most forcibly calculated to allay these colourless misgivings, and induce confidence and cheerfulness in every presentment of the voyage. Three better, more likely sea officers and men, each in his own different way, could not readily be found, and they were, every one of them, Americans, a Nantucketer, a Vineyarder, a Cape Man, now, it being Christmas when the ship shot from outer harbour, for a space we had biting polar weather, though all the time running away from it to the southward, and by every degree and minute of latitude which we sailed, gradually leaving that merciless winter and all its intolerable weather behind us. It was one of those less lowering but still grey and gloomy enough mornings of the transition, when, with a fair wind, the ship was rushing through the water, with a vindictive sort of leaping and melancholy rapidity, that as I mounted to the deck at the call of the forenoon watch, so soon as I levelled my glance toward the taffrail, foreboding shivers ran over me. Reality outran apprehension. Captain Ahab stood upon his quarter-deck. There seemed no sign of common bodily illness about him nor of the recovery from any. He looked like a man cut away from the stake, when the fire has overrunningly wasted all the limbs without consuming them, or taking away one particle from their compacted aged robustness. His whole high, broad form seemed made of solid bronze, and shaped in an unalterable mould like Cellini's cast Perseus threading its way out from among his grey hairs, and continuing right down one side of his tawny, scorched face and neck, till it disappeared in his clothing, you saw a slender, rod-like mark, lividly whitish. It resembled that perpendicular seam, sometimes made in the straight, lofty trunk of a great tree, when the upper lightning tearingly darts down it, and without wrenching a single twig peels and grooves out the bark from top to bottom, ere running off into the soil, leaving the tree still greenly alive, but branded. Whether that mark was born with him, or whether it was the scar left by some desperate wound, no one could certainly say. 
by some tacit consent throughout the voyage little or no allusion was made to it especially by the mates but once tashtego senior an old gay-head indian among the crew superstitiously asserted that not till he was full forty years old did ahab become that way branded and then it came upon him not in the fury of any mortal fray but in an elemental strife at sea yet this wild hint seemed inferentially negatived by what a grey manxman insinuated an old sepulchral man who having never before sailed out of nantucket had never ere this laid eye upon wild ahab nevertheless the old sea traditions the immemorial credulities popularly invested this old manxman with preternatural powers of discernment so that no white sailor seriously contradicted him when he said that if ever captain ahab should be tranquilly laid out which might hardly come to pass so he muttered then whoever should do that last office for the dead would find a birthmark on him from crown to sole so powerfully did the whole grim aspect of ahab affect me and the livid brand which streaked it that for the first few moments i hardly noted that not a little of this overbearing grimness was owing to the barbaric white leg upon which he partly stood it had previously come to me that this ivory leg had at sea been fashioned from the polished bone of a sperm whale's jaw ay he was dismasted off japan said the old gay-head indian once but like his dismasted craft he shipped another mast without coming home for it he has a quiver of em i was struck with the singular posture he maintained upon each side of the pequod's quarter-deck and pretty close to the mizzen shrouds there was an auger hole bored about half an inch or so into the plank his bone legs steadied in that hole one arm elevated and holding by a shroud captain ahab stood erect looking straight out beyond the ship's ever pitching prow there was an infinity of firmest fortitude a determinate unsurrenderable wilfulness in the fixed and fearless forward dedication of that glance not a word he spoke nor did his officers say aught to him though by all their minutest gestures and expressions they plainly showed the uneasy if not painful consciousness of being under a troubled master eye and not only that but moody stricken ahab stood before them with a crucifixion in his face in all the nameless regal overbearing dignity of some mighty woe ere long from his first visit in the air he withdrew into his cabin but after that morning he was every day visible to the crew either standing in his pivot hole or seated upon an ivory stool he had or heavily walking the deck as the sky grew less gloomy indeed began to grow a little genial he became still less and less a recluse as if when the ship had sailed from home nothing but the dead wintry bleakness of the sea had then kept him so secluded and by and by it came to pass that he was almost continually in the air but as yet for all that he said or perceptibly did on the at last sunny deck he seemed as unnecessary there as another mast but the pequod was only making a passage now not regularly cruising nearly all whaling preparatives needing supervision the mates were fully competent to so that there was little or nothing out of himself to employ or excite ahab now and thus chase away for that one interval the clouds that layer upon layer were piled upon his brow as ever all clouds choose the loftiest peaks to pile themselves upon nevertheless ere long the warm warbling persuasiveness of the pleasant holiday weather we came to seemed gradually to charm him from his mood for as when the red-cheeked dancing girls april and may trip home to the wintry misanthropic woods even the barest ruggedest most thunder-cloven old oak will at least send forth some few green sprouts to welcome such glad-hearted visitants so ahab did in the end a little respond to the playful allurings of that girlish air more than once did he put forth the faint blossom of a look which in any other man would have soon flowered out in a smile chapter twenty nine enter ahab to him stub 
Some days elapsed, and, ice and icebergs all astern, the Pequod now went rolling through the bright Quito spring, which at sea almost perpetually reigns on the threshold of the eternal August of the tropic. The warmly cool, clear, ringing, perfumed, overflowing, redundant days were as crystal goblets of Persian sherbet, heaped up, flaked up with rose-water snow. The starred and stately knights seemed haughty dames in jeweled velvets, nursing at home in lonely pride the memory of their absent conquering earls, the golden-helmeted sons. For sleeping man, t'was hard to choose between such winsome days and such seducing nights. But all the witcheries of that unwaning weather did not merely lend new spells and potencies to the outward world. Inward they turned upon the soul, especially when the still mild hours of eve came on. Then memory shot her crystals as the clear ice most forms of noiseless twilights. And all these subtle agencies— more and more they wrought on Ahab's texture. Old age is always wakeful, as if the longer linked with life, the less man has to do with aught that looks like death. Among sea commanders, the old greybeards will oftenest leave their berths to visit the night-cloak deck. It was so with Ahab, only that now of late he seemed so much to live in the open air, that, truly speaking, his visits were more to the cabin than from the cabin to the planks. "'It feels like going down into one's tomb,' he would mutter to himself, "'for an old captain like me to be descending this narrow scuttle, to go to my grave-dug berth.'" So, almost every twenty-four hours, when the watches of the night were set, and the band on deck sentineled the slumbers of the band below, and when, if a rope was to be hauled upon the forecastle, the sailors flung it not rudely down as by day, but with some cautiousness dropped it to its place for fear of disturbing their slumbering shipmates, when this sort of steady quietude would begin to prevail, habitually the silent steersman would watch the cabin scuttle, and ere long the old man would emerge, gripping at the iron banister to help his crippled way. Some considering touch of humanity was in him, for at times like these he usually abstained from patrolling the quarter-deck, because to his wearied mates, seeking repose within six inches of his ivory heel, such would have been the reverberating crack and din of that bony step that their dreams would have been on the crunching teeth of sharks. But once the mood was on him too deep for common regardings, and, as with heavy lumber-like pace he was measuring the ship from taffrail to mainmast, Stubb, the old second mate, came up from below, with a certain unassured deprecating humorousness, hinted that if Captain Ahab was pleased to walk the planks, then no one could say nay, but there might be some way of muffling the noise, hinting something indistinctly and hesitatingly about a globe of tow and the insertion into it of the ivory heel. Ah, Stubb, thou didst not know Ahab then. Am I a cannon-ball, Stubb, said Ahab, that thou wouldst wad me that fashion? But go thy ways, I had forgot. Below to thy nightly grave, where such as ye sleep between shrouds, to use ye to filling one at last. Down, dog, and kennel! Starting at the unforeseen concluding exclamation of the so suddenly scornful old man, Stubb was speechless for a moment, and then said excitedly, "'I am not used to be spoken to that way, sir. I do but less than half like it, sir.' "'Avast!' gritted Ahab between his set teeth, and violently moving away as if to avoid some passionate temptation. "'No, sir, not yet,' said Stubb, emboldened. I will not tamely be called a dog, sir. Then be called ten times a donkey and a mule and an ass, and be gone or I'll clear the world of thee. As he said this, Ahab advanced upon him with such overbearing terrors in his aspect that Stubb involuntarily retreated. I was never served so before without giving a hard blow for it, muttered Stubb, as he found himself descending the cabin scuttle. It's very queer. Stop, Stubb. Somehow, now, 
I don't well know whether to go back and strike him, or what's that? Down here on my knees and pray for him? Yes, that was the thought coming up in me. But it would be the first time I ever did pray. It's queer, very queer. And he's queer, too. I take him fore and aft. He's about the queerest old man Stubb ever sailed with. How he flashed at me! His eyes like powder pans. Is he mad? Anyway, there's something on his mind, as sure as there must be something on a deck when it cracks. He ain't in his bed now, either, more than three hours out of twenty-four, and he don't sleep then. Didn't that doughboy, the steward, tell me that of a morning he always finds the old man's hammock clothes all rumpled and tumbled, and the sheets down at the foot, and the cover lid almost tied into knots, and the pillow a sort of frightful hot, as though a baked brick had been on it? A hot old man. I guess he's got what some folks ashore call a conscience. It's a kind of tick-dolly row, they say. Worse nor a toothache. Well, well, I don't know what it is, but the Lord keep me from catching it. He's full of riddles. I wonder what he goes into the afterhold for every night, as Doughboy tells me he suspects. What's that for, I should like to know? Who's made appointments with him in the hold? Ain't that queer now? But there's no telling. It's the old game. Here it goes for a snooze. Damn me, it's worth a fellow's while to be born into the world, if only to fall right asleep. And now that I think of it, that's about the first thing babies do. And that's sort of queer, too. Damn me, but all things are queer, come to think of them. But that's against my principles. Think not is my eleventh commandment, and sleep when you can is my twelfth. So here goes again. But how's that? Didn't he call me a dog? Blazes! He called me ten times a donkey, and piled a lot of jackasses on top of that. He might as well have kicked me and be done with it. Maybe he did kick me, and I didn't observe it. I was so taken all aback with his brow, somehow. It flashed like a bleached bone. What the devil's the matter with me? I don't stand right on my legs. Coming afoul of that old man has a sort of turned me wrong side out. By the Lord, I must have been dreaming, though. How? 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 But the only way is to stash it. So here goes to hammock again, and in the morning I'll see how this plaguy juggling thinks over by daylight. Chapter 30 The Pipe When Stubb had departed, Ahab stood for a while leaning over the bulwarks, and then, as had been usual with him of late, calling a sailor of the watch, he sent him below for his ivory stool and also his pipe. Lighting his pipe at the binnacle lamp and planting the stool on the weather side of the deck, he sat and smoked. In old Norse times the thrones of the sea-loving Danish kings were fabricated, saith tradition, of the tusks of the narwhale. How could one look at Ahab, then, seated on that tripod of bones, without bethinking him of the royalty it symbolized? For a Khan of the Plank, and a King of the Sea, and a great Lord of Leviathans, was Ahab. Some moments passed, during which the thick vapor came from his mouth in quick and constant puffs, which blew back again into his face. "'How now?' he soliloquized at last, withdrawing the tube. This smoking no longer soothes. Ah, oh, my pipe! Hard must it go with me if thy charm be gone. Here have I been unconsciously toiling, not pleasuring, I and ignorantly smoking to windward all the while, to windward, and with such nervous whiffs, as if, like the dying whale, my final jets were the strongest and fullest of trouble. What business have I with this pipe? this thing that is meant for sereneness, to send up mild white vapors among mild white hairs, not among torn iron-gray locks like mine. I'll smoke no more. He tossed the still-lighted pipe into the sea. The fire hissed in the waves. The same instant the ship shot by the bubble the sinking pipe made. With slouched hat, Ahab lurchingly paced the planks. CHAPTER Thirty One, QUEEN MAB Next morning Stubb accosted Flask. 
such a queer dream, King Post, I never had. You know the old man's ivory leg? Well, I dreamed he kicked me with it. And when I tried to kick back upon my soul, my little man, I kicked my leg right off. And then presto, Ahab seemed a pyramid, and I, like a blazing fool, kept kicking at it. But what was still more curious, Flask, you know how curious all dreams are, through all this rage that I was in, I somehow seemed to be thinking to myself that, after all, it was not much of an insult, that kick from Ahab. Why, thinks I, what's the row? It's not a real leg, only a false leg. And there's a mighty difference between a living thump and a dead thump. That's what makes a blow from the hand, Flask, fifty times more savage to bear than a blow from a cane. The living member. That makes the living insult, my little man. And thinks I to myself all the while, mind, while I was stubbing my silly toes against that cursed pyramid, so confoundedly contradictory was it all all the while, I say, I was thinking to myself, what's his leg now but a cane, a whalebone cane? Yes, thinks I. It was only a playful cudgeling, in fact only a whale-boning that he gave me, not a base kick. Besides, thinks I, look at it once, why, the end of it, the foot part, what a small sort of end it is, whereas if a broad-footed farmer kicked me, there's a devilish broad insult. But this insult is whittled down to a point only. But now comes the greatest joke of the dream, Flask. While I was battering away at the pyramid, a sort of badger-haired old merman, with a hump on his back, takes me by the shoulders and slews me round. "'What are you about?' says he. "'Slid, man, but I was frightened. Such a fizz! But somehow next moment I was over the fright. "'What am I about?' says I at last. "'And what business is that of yours, I should like to know, Mr. Humpback? Do you want a kick?' "'By the Lord, Flask, I had no sooner said that.' Then he turned round his stern to me, bent over, and dragging up a lot of seaweed he had for a clout, what do you think I saw? Why, thunder alive, man, his stern was stuck full of marlin spikes, with the points out. Says I, on second thoughts, I guess I won't kick you, old fellow. Wise stub, says he, wise stub, and kept muttering it all the time, a sort of eating of his own gums like a chimney hag. Seeing he wasn't going to stop saying over his wise stub, wise stub, I thought I might as well fall to kicking the pyramid again. But I had only just lifted my foot for it when he roared out, Stop that kicking! Hello, says I, what's the matter now, old fellow? Look ye here, says he, let's argue the insult. Captain Ahab kicked you, didn't he? Yes, he did, says I, right here it was. Very good, says he, he used his ivory leg, didn't he? Yes, he did, says I. Well, then, says he, wise stub, what have you to complain of? Didn't he kick you with right good will? It wasn't a common pitch-pine leg he kicked with, was it? No, you were kicked by a great man, and with a beautiful ivory leg, stub. It's an honor. I consider it an honor. Listen, wise stub. In old England, the greatest lords think it great glory to be slapped by a queen, and made garter knights of but be your boast, Stub, that ye were kicked by old Ahab, and made a wise man of. Remember what I say. Be kicked by him. Account his kicks honors, and on no account kick back, for you can't help yourself, wise Stub. Don't you see that pyramid? With that he all of a sudden seemed somehow, in some queer fashion, to swim off into the air. I snored, rolled over, and there I was in my hammock. Now what do you think of that dream flask? I don't know. It seems sort of foolish to me, though. Maybe, maybe, but it's made a wise man of me, flask. Do you see Ahab standing there, sideways looking over the stern? Well, the best thing you can do, flask, is to let the old man alone. Never speak to him, whatever he says. Hello! What's that he shouts? Hark! Masthead there! Look sharp, all of ye! There are whales hereabouts. If you see a white one, split your lungs for him. What do you think of that now, Flask? Ain't there a small drop of something queer about that, eh? A white whale. Did you mark that, man? Look ye, there's something special in the wind. Stand by for it, Flask. Ahab has that that's bloody on his mind. But, Mum, he comes this way. 
End of chapters 28 to 31.